Welcome everyone. I'm Anne Marie Slaughter, the CEO of New America, and I'm very excited about this book. When I was Dean in the uh, aughts at the Princeton School of Public and International Affairs, I wanted to create a joint degree between public policy and engineering. Uh, we'd actually had such a de degree in the 1960s, and I thought it would be great if we could do it again with a particular focus uh, on technology and public policy. Uh, well, I, I worked hard at it, and I succeeded only in hiring one computer professor, computer science professor. That was Ed Felton, who went on to be deputy CTO, so it was a pretty good pick. But we did not succeed in getting a joint degree, and I think it is still true that public policy students graduate knowing as little about technology and the internet as if they didn't know what a supply or a demand curve was in economics. I hope this book will help change that uh, and to make clear just how important it is. I think the best thing I can do is just read you a passage from the afterward to the book, which Darren Walker, president and CEO of the Ford Foundation, co-authored with me. We said that we hope that professors in all universities and colleges will assign the problems, power to the public, as the first book on the syllabus for any course exploring how technology can be used in the public interest. We hope that college and university presidents will choose it as a first year read. We hope that nonprofit organizations, from think tanks to community advocacy and service providers, will recommend it as a must read for their staff. We hope that aspiring politicians at every level, from the school board to the cabinet, will read it and reimagine what government can do and how it must do it. We hope it will be a requirement for anyone hoping to take the civil service or foreign service exams for both federal and state government. People throughout the United States and around the world need hope and belief in our collective capacity to solve problems. Indeed, in many countries, certainly including the United States, we need to forge a new social contract with our governments to provide health, justice, liberty, equality, safety, and prosperity through new and far more equitable systems. For all who seek to engage in this work, power to the public is both a manual and a manifesto. So with that, I want to introduce uh, our authors uh, and our moderator, and we're going to have a fabulous discussion. Hannah Shank uh, is, a is the, the strategy director for the Public Interest Technology Program at New America. There, she works to develop the field of public interest technology through research and storytelling and hands-on project work. She founded and ran a user experience and research consultancy in the private sector for over a decade, uh, and then became a public sector convert when she joined the US Digital Service uh, during the Obama administration, where she worked with the Department of Homeland Security. Tara, Mag Tara McGinnis, the other co-author of uh, Power to the Public, is the founder of the New Practice Lab at New America. That is New America's program dedicated to people-centered, experimental, data-enabled public problem solving with a particular focus on family economic security. Tara knows quite a bit uh, about social policy and delivery because she was part of the healthcare.gov team in the Obama administration. Maybe I should say she knows quite a bit about what not to do uh, because she was part of that team and had to help fix uh, that the initial debacle. She's back working at New America now uh, after a seven month leave where she ran the domestic policy team for the Biden transition. Uh, she is also the former director of the Center for, American, Center for American Progress Action Fund. Clarence Wardell, our moderator, is senior advisor for delivery with the US Digital Service focused on domestic policy. But let me make absolutely clear, although he is now in government, he is with us in his, only in his private capacity. We know him well at New America because he was in our first class of public interest technology fellows. He, uh, Cla Clarence, I can't imagine really a better uh, moderator. He's had enormous experience in the Biden administration working on the police 
uh, Data Initiative uh, as a Presidential Innovation Fellow under President Obama. And also he was Vice President for Solutions at Results for America. I'm not going to go any further to describe the public interest technology program in the new practice lab. You'll hear plenty about this. Uh, I really want to get to the conversation and then your questions. So Clarence, over to you. Great. Uh, thank you, Anne-Marie, uh, for such a kind uh, introduction. Um, I am super excited to be here. Um, I have um, had the, the opportunity to call uh, both Hannah and uh, Tara and colleagues uh, in some form or fashion um, throughout uh, my work in the public interest tech space, uh, as well as theirs. Um, I should say as like a, um, an idealistic uh, computer engineering undergraduate student uh, who um, in the early aughts, I think as Anne-Marie said, um, was curious about a way to forge a career um, that was closer to public policy and that brought my skill set at the time in, into a, uh, a meaningful place, but not really seeing any pathways for that at the time. Um, I'm, I'm really excited about this text um, and um, in, in this moment that we're in and in, in, in the work that New America has done and, you know, having had an opportunity to be a part of a little bit of part of that in the past um, to start to create and shape that field um, that I think will pay um, huge dividends um, over time, both in terms of the work that can be done and quite frankly, by naming and creating the field and the space, um, I think it will um, do wonders for diversity of, of, of the types of folks that, that show up to solve our problems um, in the public sphere. Um, kind of with that, and maybe I'll just stay there for a little bit. Um, well, I just said, would encourage, uh, we're, gonna, we're gonna do a bit of a Q and A here, but uh, if folks have questions, uh, please share those in chat. And, and I, I don't know if there are other mechanisms as well. Um, we will have ample time for those. Um, but I would just say with that and, the, and the, the excitement and what I think will be a, uh, a text that will be used in um, uh, uh, higher education, hopefully for, for years to come, um, there, I, I should, I'd be remiss in noting that there, there are quite a few uh, books kind of in this space um, over the last year or so, and I know of a couple of others that are in the process. Um, can you say a little bit about, from your perspectives, like why this book, why now, and what, what is it about this moment where we're seeing so many folks um, who are writing about this area and excited about the possibility uh, that it holds? Sure. Thanks, Clarence and Anne-Marie and Hannah and everyone who's joining us. This is super fun. Um, you know, why write a book right now? I think there's probably hasn't been a year on record like 2020 or 2021 where um, the need for government to help and nonprofits that work couldn't be crystal clearer, whether that's to, to make sure we know that we do or have to wear masks or to get vaccines in your arm or when you lose your job like 29 million Americans did at one point this year to be able to have um, unemployment insurance. And so I think we have for a while worked with a number of leaders and folks who saw the importance not just of great ideas, but um, the ability for governments and nonprofits and institutions in a digital age to really bring these policies to market, to reach people where they are, um, to get checks in people's pockets and shots in their arms. And so we saw a few number of organizations and teams really doing things differently, a new approach. We'll talk more about them from Code to America to USDS and ATNF or Community Solutions working on homelessness. But we really at our core wrote this book now um, to expand the people who are doing this type of problem solving work. And um, I'll just add that as, as we were um, writing this, we were also kind of living, so for a long time um, at New America in the PIT program, we have been saying, there needs to be more tech expertise in government and things are gonna, something really bad's gonna happen. And I think something really bad's gonna happen. It's gonna be bad. Um, and then as we were writing it, we were like, oh, here it is. Here's the moment all these um, unemployment databases are crashing. Um, all of these, uh, you know, people, as Tara said, people really need government. Uh, and we were kind of watching this unfold as we were writing this. Um, so uh, it's something that I think we've been saying for a long time needs attention, um, and then the world, uh, the world paid attention. Great. Um, 
in the book, you, you begin and it's kind of, you know, foundational. You, you talk about these three cornerstones, if you will, of public problem solving and public interest technology, um, design, data, and delivery. Um, I, I think we, we will certainly touch on all of those throughout this conversation. Um, the one that I want to start with a little bit is, is maybe the one that's least familiar with um, for folks, um, and certainly maybe folks kind of outside of this kind of community or eco immediate ecosystem, I, I've certainly gotten looks myself when, you know, I talk about, you know, delivery um, and, and government services and, you know, folks would think, well, you know, the postal service does that, or, you know, Amazon gets my packages there. Is that the type of delivery you're talking about? Um, can you um, maybe, Tar, you know, say a little bit about uh, what, what do you mean by delivery, um, and, and how does that show up, and what is why why was that one of the the, the places you chose to focus uh, the, the work and content of this book? Sure, um, and Hannah, jump in. I think delivery and data. We really think about um, reaching people where they are. Um, and on the delivery side, that's about thinking from the beginning to the end. On the design side, it's really about understanding who you're serving. And so, um, you know, who are the people you're reaching with your program and how would they know it exists um, and how does it reach them? So um, we tell a story in the book that this is while this science of, of design has really been refined by um, the private sector and doing everything from selling but you know, things via Amazon to um, to really perfecting the size of a font in an email that you get about a spring dress, that this is an old practice. You know, um, President Lincoln used to open the gates of the White House, literally made his advisors bananas. And like once a week, he'd just have people come in and explain what their issues were and how the government could help. And it, he was sort of the first user, researcher, listener, organizer in chief. And we're making the case in the book that we need to do, build this muscle of designing government programs for people in a stronger way. Tell an amazing story about in your home state, Clarence of Michigan, a design team, a small nonprofit team um, led by a former uh, nonprofit leader in the state who worked on poverty for years that became obsessed with a form, you know, the, the quintessential image of government bureaucracy is forms. And the form um, was 1,200 questions long, 18,000 words. It was the form for emergency assistance. If you lost your house, you needed emergency cash, uh, you know, you needed low cost healthcare and you were in trouble, the thing that sat between you and these services was this form that was really maybe not designed for humans. And the venture of Sevilla in trying to tackle this form, which they cut by 80% and reduced the time by half and really made benefits that were kind of a maze accessible is an example of kind of the modern tools of what I think President Lincoln was doing, which was just having big ears and listening to the people we serve. And we're making the case that building out this form of institution on uh, listening and design while, while it could be uh, something you learn at the Stanford D School, um, it's also relatively intuitive that a 1,200 questions might be, a, a, you know, 1,100 <laughs> and 60 too many. Um, so this, this is what we really mean when we're talking about design. And I think, you know, Hannah, maybe I kick it um, to you a little bit on the delivery side, but we see these three pieces as fitting together. Um, yeah, and yeah. I just maybe want to ask, and, and and Hannah, just building on that, and and one piece related to that that you you all talk about it with related to the delivery work is like in order to I think this notion of like in order to solve big problems you need to start small, um, and so maybe you could also just say a little bit about that and how that showed up in the Sevilla story or 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 some of the other uh, work that you all highlight in the book. Uh, yeah, so one of the stories that we tell um, about started to illustrate the point of starting small is um, the Integrated Benefits Initiative, which was a project that uh, the state of Vermont undertook. Um, and uh, they, well, and so before I get into the story, let me say we talk in the book about the importance of starting small. A lot of the time, um, and this is something that 
we see all the time that there's a there's a modernization project and it's enormous and it takes months to gather the requirements and then by the time you've gathered the requirements they're actually out of date and are they actually doing the thing you want i don't know um so the uh the the counter the counter version of building an enormous thing is start in a small place um, find a small thing that is meaningful, bite, bite off a small chunk, um, and really get that piece to function really well. So um, we tell the story in, um, in the book about this project um, that the state of Vermont undertook to improve um, how people apply for, uh, for, for benefits um, in the state of Vermont. And um, this was a project that uh, the the nonprofit um, company Nava took on, um, and what they when they went in, the current state of things was that people had to bring their uh, paperwork directly to the benefits office in order to apply. And what would happen is they would bring their paperwork. It wouldn't be the right thing. They'd have to make another trip. Um, if you've ever been to Vermont, it's not easy to get there from one from one point to another. Um, and uh, we also saw that, and they um, the team also saw that people um, were constrained by the office hours. You can only bring in your paperwork when the office is open. So they had this theory that if um, that piece, uh, if they started with that piece and put that piece online by creating a small document uploader, um, that that would significantly significantly improve the speed with which people were able to process uh, to get processed for benefits. Um, when they began the process, it was nine days from putting absolutely everything in, bringing all of your paperwork in um, to get a determination as to whether you were going to get the benefit. Um, so they started with they built a small uploader, a uh, document uploader that could work online. Um, and they tested it with 50 people. And that was it. That was the project. They tested it with 50 people. Um, what they found was that uh, during, and while they were piloting this, um, they found that uh, during the pilot, 55% of the people in the pilot received a, a determination, apologies, a determination within 24 hours compared to nine days. Um, they also found that 40% of the people who um, in the pilot, 40% used the uploader outside of office hours. So that confirmed their, their guess that actually these office hours and these trips back and forth to this government office were um, really slowing down the process. Um, so they were able ultimately to roll the uploader out to the entire state. Um, and we love that story as a great example of like, here's a massive problem start with a small thing. That's great. It's a super helpful uh, example there. And, and maybe just building off that a little bit. And, um, you know, really, your, your book is is quite uh, relevant for the moment we're in now. Um, and even just, um, you know, putting a finer point on it, um, American Rescue Plan has passed recently, close to $2 trillion um, heading out the door. Um, quite a lot of that is uh, at the state and local level, uh, where uh, those governments will be charged with uh, delivering um, critical services on very short timelines in a moment where, where folks are still looking for a, a life rope, if you will, uh, to stay in their home, to feed their kids, et cetera. Um, what lessons um, would you all, do you think are most salient uh, for folks who are charged with implementing these programs at the moment um, and what kind of one or two things would you lift up um, as part of that and, and 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 maybe another piece of this is what looks different you know a little bit on timelines in, in your book some of the examples you talk about there was a pretty long and, and you talk about this a lot of this work is not you know hey we're just going to fix this overnight it is it's it's really moving boulders up mountains type work. Um, and it takes folks who are really dedicated to it. And, and sometimes it's, it's a year, two years plus until you see that breakthrough and then it can go from there. We're in a crisis moment right now. Dollars are coming. Folks have to make quick decisions, stand up programs quickly. Uh, what lessons, principles can they take from your text um, as they think about uh, the work that sits in front of them? 
Um, as Anne-Marie mentioned, um, a lot of my thinking about this, I really cut my teeth on the Affordable Care Act, but um, it's not the only example. You could look back to the CARES Act, which was passed in the spring um, uh, under COVID-19 and the payroll protection provisions that put dollars out to, to small businesses or the unemployment insurance sites that um, the importance of uh, legislation is critically important. The American Rescue Plan that passed as the potential to change the fabric of um, our country and how we um, support, especially families with young children. If the policies are implemented well, it could be um, to cut child poverty in half and it would be the single largest investment in child care since World War II. The stakes are remarkably high, um, but they all depend on delivery. And so Clarence, to your question of what lessons from the past, um, I think one, prioritizing the things that are um, the most impactful, getting the child tax credit out the door in real time to families, um, uh, getting being focused not on the, not just on the what, the amount of dollars, but the how. How will this you know reach families that are um, unbanked? We saw in a, a really deep learnings of the uh, frustrations, but also the possible. Um, over the past couple of months, the, there are still 10 million people who, the, the probably poorest 10 million Americans who are stimulus check eligible, never received their first or second stimulus check. They don't file taxes. It's not easy to know how to send them a check. So looking into the details of how you reach people, in particular, how you reach the most vulnerable. I do want to say it's not impossible. When Hannah and I were writing about the CARES Act, we interviewed and we talked to the book to the deputy finance minister of Germany. It caught our eye that while the websites were crashing all across the country here, that there was an article that re described the German gig worker relief as I think simple and refreshing. <laughs> the payments went out in 14 days and reached the type of workers that we have a hard time reaching in the country. And so I wanna suggest that reaching people with emergency services when they need them is not putting a man on the moon or one on the moon. It has been done and will be done, but it does take a level of attention and care to where people are and how they live um, that I think, um, you know, the, the Biden administration has demonstrated already, um, but that there are plenty of great role, you know, models around about what good looks like. And uh, I'll just add to that, that, um, uh, that we talk in the book about having a focus on delivery and that a lot of um, that delivery does not mean pizza. Um, and I think that one of the pieces um, with the American Rescue Plan and also that we, we talk about uh, the CARES Act in, in the book is this relentless focus on delivery. And you the, the, the what has been defined, but then how does that actually get to people piloting that, testing that, um, even if you're in a time crunch, there is still the capability to follow, um, you know, sort of unpeel the onion of how, how is actually, how's this actually going to happen? We said this is going to happen, this is the thing to do. We know that this is going to be the right intervention, um, but how does that actually happen? And part of the issue is that the way that that happens for the world has changed dramatically in the last five to 10 years. Um, you know, it used to be the way things were delivered where you stood online or you went to a place or you faxed, some, faxed something. Um, and all of those pipelines have changed significantly just how we function as a society um, and government has lagged behind. So um, it's, that said, um, it's also, you know, Tara was talking about Lincoln opening his doors that that used to be, you know, and then uh, and taking in information um, delivery used to be in some ways a lot easier because there were only there were you had limited choices um, there. Are, it's now become really kind of the thing um, in recent years, as we all live in these um, live in this world where delivery has been really streamlined in the private sector. Um, and what we need to make happen is uh, have that happen in the public sector as well. Great, thank you. Um, I wanna turn a little bit to one of your other pillars, um, data, uh, and, and talk a little bit both about the, the opportunities there um, and why it is a critical piece to the, um, uh, to the pro public problem solving uh, apparatus, um, but also, 
and maybe even more importantly, spend a little bit of time on the, the harms of not kind of considering, um, you know, where you're getting your feedback and intake from and, and, and really interrogating uh, what is this data telling me about this program, about the people who the program is intending to serve, um, and about how we've developed or designed it. And, and I'll just offer a, you know, an example, and, you know, Tara, when you and I met, uh, uh, Dear colleague and friend Denise Ross, who was on your team, uh, who was a partner of mine uh, working on the uh, police data initiative during the uh, Obama administration. Um, you know, we would often, and, and just a, a word for folks, you know, it was an effort uh, by the administration to, to work with police departments across the country to help them open up and share data around police citizen interactions. And we would often get these questions of, oh, well, that's, that's, that's great, but um, how quickly shouldn't we be taking this data and, and using it for things like predictive policing and the like? Um, and, you know, that was like the last thing at that moment that we wanted anybody to do or to think that was the goal of that work, um, just because that data was was really poor. Um, and it had, had never in many ways seen the light of day. Um, and there was not a lot of standardization. And so, um, you know, that was one, you know, just, just reflecting on my own experience and kind of like when, when you say data, like people kind of immediately jump to the okay, what does it tell us? And then like, let's build a solution from there. You all offer some cautions in the book. Uh, there's an example I particularly love uh, from New York uh, about um, uh, the former chief uh, was chief analytics officer, Aman Ra, uh, Mashariki um, and rats in, in New York City. Maybe you could talk about that one uh, a little bit. Uh, sure, this is one of our, this is a great story. Um, I, and I actually uh, had met Aman Ra at a, um, at, randomly at an event and he told this story and I know like and this was a few years ago and I never forgot it because it was it was such an impactful story um, on what you really get with data um, and I think I will just preface this by saying we're we're in a we're in a pit moment but we're also in a data moment um, we have a lot of data everyone has a lot of data um, and I think that we are just starting to um, we're just starting to understand uh, the good and the bad uh, when it comes to data. I actually have a, um, a friend who uh, says that his company is not um, data driven, they're data hysterical. And I think that that's a, a good way to, um, to think about like, are we actually using this data in the right way? So, um, in, so uh, Amin, Ma Rashariq, Amin Ra Mashariki, um, who was with the, uh, in, the, in New York, the Office of um, Data Analytics, uh, they, the New York City had decided to tackle the rat problem, um, and which I have to imagine is a thing that comes up all the time. Um, and uh, what the first thing they did was they mapped the 311 data um, on rat complaints to the neighborhoods. And so when um, Amon Ra received the data, the first thing that he did was look do the, he did the natural thing, which is like, oh, let me look at my neighborhood and see how the rat situation is in my neighborhood. And he lived in a um, part of Brooklyn near where he'd grown up in the projects. Um, and there were no rat complaints or very few rat complaints um, in his neighborhood. And he, and also particularly in the, from the projects. And he knew because he still lived in the neighborhood, he saw the rats, he knew there were rats. Um, so he called a friend of his, but he didn't see them reflect, see that reflected in the data. So he called a friend of his who he'd grown up with, who still lived in public housing um, and said, what's, what's the story with the rats there? You don't know more rats? And um, his friend said, well, no, of course there are rats. And Amon Ra said, well, why don't you ever call, why don't you call 311? And his friend said, what's 311? Um, so I think this is something that most people working with data today uh, know that three on one tends to um, pull from a certain sector of the population. Um, and so the true story of the rats was not reflected by purely looking at the three on one data. Um, but one of the things that we love about this story is that it shows why you have to understand who, when you're looking at a data set, who's in the data and who's not in that, who's not represented in that data. Um, and the, this is a really a key question is to ask, well, okay, well, who's not here um, that maybe it should be, or if they're not, let's dig into why they're not. Um, and also that it's really important to, um, that the people who are parsing the data and who are looking at it have a different background. 
um, have different backgrounds so that they are able, because of course we all bring our, our own background and our own lived experience to whatever it is that we're looking at. Um, and when you're, we're looking at, when you're looking at a city's rat data, the people looking at that should probably look like a, the same people in the subway car, right? Um, you want people from all over the city to be represented on these teams. Um, so it's really critical that anyone who works with data sets consider the, lim the limits of what those numbers tell us about the lived experience of the people that are represented in the data. Great, thank you, Hannah. Um, kind of relate related to that, um, you know, I think there and there is a. I'm gonna I'm gonna submit. There's kind of a fourth pillar here um, that would be a, a strong foundation for our house um, that is not that you all talk about actually, and, and you mention it throughout the book. And I think there's a um, um, a really good quote from uh, or in an interview with uh, DJ Patel, the former uh, chief data scientist for the U.S. Uh, in the book that talks about this notion of empathy, compassion, um, storytelling, that really braids the three design, data, and delivery together. Um, and, and I think just even the case studies that you have in your book, there's always this moment of needing to persuade someone, needing to convince, and, and really um, the, the actors in that story are bringing all three of those pieces together um, to do that work. Right, and that's often the moment that it kind of unlocks the the work. That you know, there's still more work after that. Like that's usually on the, the the front end, but that creates the space for the work. Um, and so I submit that this kind of you know storytelling persuasion piece is is a critical tool of the the in the public interest technologist uh, toolbox. Um, can you all say a little bit more about that um, and where and how you see that show up uh, in some of the work that you've identified? to jump in i think in part it's the driver of why we wrote the book you know this is about making a type of work that isn't about the what it's about the how visible um and if you you know i, I think we should be really clear that um these three elements it's not a choose your own salad you, you need to do all three um we in part I think the rat story tells you about the dangers of data without really checking in with the humans. Um, and all of the stories we feature are about um, organizations and leaders who are using data in creative ways to see whether they're making progress, but who are not relying on big data alone to understand the problem. We feature um, Built for Zero and Community Solutions, a nonprofit that's working in 75 communities across the country. And really, Clarence, to your question about storytelling, it was a, a storytelling effort that got them out of how they did their work in the first place. Um, they ran a big national campaign uh, where they got, you know, local groups to, they tried to, to it was called the 100,000 Homes Campaign. And if you ask them, they will tell you it was a swimming success. People loved it and it failed. <laughs> they got 100,000 people in their homes in a period where the rate of homelessness went up. But it was a success because they engaged community leaders and members at, uh, to go out and actually engage and get the true stories of unhoused individuals. Find out what motivated them, where they got stuck, how they loved the Chicago Red Sox. And it was this deep engagement with not a statistic, <laughs> so Chicago White Sox, not a statistic, um, but the people in seeing the problem. And so the, the ability to build empathy, not for how are we doing on a graph or chart, but how are we doing in serving Tara McGinnis, who is here for this reason, was really critical. But it is, I think the power is in these three and, and, the, and the story of what is the real problem and what is the barrier that you get from some of the deep engagement and asking people in human-centered design, I think really helps make the case for difficult shifts. Um, but it's it's really mission critical. And if you look at uh, many of our stories, um, the team in Michigan made a made four senior state leaders walk through the shoes of what it was like to fill out that application. They invited them not to see a not to read a memo or a briefing deck, but the Sevilla team basically enacted the experience that any one of the 2.5 Michiganders has walking into a government office and seeking help. They didn't have enough chairs. 
There were not enough pens, nor was there not was there enough time to fill out the form. And after those officials felt what it felt like and walked in the shoes of the people they serve, they committed on the spot to cut the form down. And so that it is the power, as you raised, of the stories, which are not bespoke, which are the stories of millions of Americans and millions of folks around the world. So I think you really touched on something that we try to animate, um, which is really deeply engaging the human story, but with how that plays out, you know, in a scaled way. And, and if you, um, and, and thanks, Dara, um, I, I just even want to pull out a little thread there from one of the organizations that you mentioned, be remiss in saying, um, you know, you featured them, uh, Built for Zero and the Community Solutions Team just won the MacArthur Foundation's uh, 100 and Change uh, Award, which is an award, that I think, the first time they've done this, $100 million to one organization, one proposal that has the opportunity in our lifetimes to, to meaningfully change the outcome of, a, of, of what is perceived to be an intractable kind of societal issue. Um, can you say just a little bit about what, um, you know, what type of validation that is for these approaches and, you know, what a hundred million dollars is a lot of money. Um, what, what, um, how should they be thinking about, um, you know, how would you think about, you know, the scale again, you know, back to Anna's uh, earlier point of like, you know, starting small to go big. Now we're going really, really big. Right. And so what does that, what does that look like in this case? I'm happy to jump in or Hannah, if you would like to. I mean, first we were, we studied Built for Zero and their work, which is, is what they, you know, they started with 100,000 homes campaign and they, they said, housing 100,000 people is not enough. We need to go for zero. Their mission, which they've achieved in over a dozen locations is zero homelessness, not a little less, not a, hey, what's a, what would be an acceptable rate of homelessness for us to have? Um, and I think this, this ambition that they had, that this is a solvable problem, was the first part of their work. Second, we, we've been interviewing their um, civil servant partners in Rockford, Illinois, former mayors, their staffers, their zeal, dedication, and constant culture of learning is remarkable. And if the 100,000 and change um, effort helps other organizations to take their methods that would be an even you know, bigger success. Hey, does it sound like a lot of money? Yeah, you know what? You know who spends 100,000 and change every year on a data system for homelessness? Every person on this call. That is about the average amount that the federal government pays to a handful of federal contractors who help cities assess their data on homelessness. It's mostly, it, it doesn't help Built for Zero built a lightweight couple hundred thousand dollar version of that um, that really helped people understand the inflow and outflow data. It's a good example of how you can spend millions of dollars on data systems by very important technology companies, but not be solving the problem. And so we could not be more excited. I think um, you can probably hear from Hannah and I that every every story we learned about, we became we felt we fell in love with Built for Zero. We fell in love with Sevilla. We we were so passionate um, learning from these kind of tremendous leaders at the state and local and federal level that we really just wanted everyone to hear their stories. And so we're delighted and hope that 100 million and change will help more people hear their story too. And I'll just add to that uh, something that we've sort of I think as we mentioned but haven't fully articulated, which is that um, this work really requires buy-in from the top, um, but it also requires buy-in from the frontline workers who are going to be doing things differently with their job, so on a daily basis. Um, and for the the stories that we profile in the book, they had that like there there was a lot of work put into cultivating those relationships, design with not for. Um, making sure that people who are the um, the frontline staff were were bought in and really excited and thinking that this was a great idea and <clears throat> that the person at the very top it can't happen without somebody at the very without a champion at the very top saying this is how it's going to be it's going this is what we're going to do um, and saying that repeatedly and repeatedly and and uh, you know I think that the the empathy building um, that Tara mentioned is uh, with the Michigan form 
was critical. Um, and we saw instances, instances of that in every project, uh, in every uh, story that we tell in the book. Great, uh, thank you both. Um, we're gonna turn to some audience questions now um, in, in doing this a little bit differently than we would have in the, the before times. Um, and so also encourage folks, you know, if you have questions, continue to drop them in the chat. Uh, one question that it looks like we've gotten a little um, from a few different folks and a few different flavors, but it's basically kind of, I think the same question. Um, and I will note um, that I think you dedicate uh, effectively a whole chapter to this in your book. Um, and it's this notion of like, what does this, what, what distinguishes this, this, this field or this practice, quote unquote, of public interest technology, you know, and I, and I will say is like, again, kind of a bit of my background, you know, I, I the, up until the last few years, like this was a, you know, a new term to me, um, you know, I was more of kind of in the, the civic tech, uh, you know, this is all kind of a, just an extension of civic tech. Um, but you talk about this in your book, you talk about, you know, and, and you, you honor in many ways, you know, the, the, the folks in the fields and the, the ideas that have come before this moment. You talk about how this is different, though, from civic tech, from gov tech, um, different than just like digitizing government, so to speak. Um, can you all say a little bit more about, you know, why this term public interest technology and, and what does that what does that actually mean? And say a little bit about why it's not really about the technology you talk about in your book. Uh, shall I start? Okay. Um, so yes. Okay. Well, so first of all, uh, when we, we do, I don't want to get too much in the weeds given the time. And the, I mean, we could talk all day about this, but um, we go into the book, uh, we go into the why public interest technology versus civic tech versus gov tech. Um, I think the main thing that we want to get across about public interest technology is that it is an approach to problem solving in the digital age, uh, to public problem solving. Um, the, uh, those other, the other terms don't fully encompass, um, you know, they might sort of encompass a loose configuration of, uh, or conglomeration of people, but we felt that public interest technology um, is really a, a, a term that, um, that can be used for the field, but also for a methodology. Um, and it is tricky. Where does technology fit? Um, technology is in the title. And yet, um, if you read the book, oh, there's an entire chapter called It's Not About the Technology, um, which is confusing, especially we talk about um, when we talk about our uh, training the next generation of uh, tech of public servants. And we talk about um, that the people who are uh, studying to be public servants should have some tech fluency and people who have a tech background should know that public service is an option for them. Um, there are, there is a, so I think that is to differentiate between the commonly accepted narrative about government and technology, which is that if you can just get more white male Google engineers and stuff them into the White House, your problems will be solved. And um, the really, we are trying to bring home the message that um, it's it's not it's not actually about the technology. It's about the humans. It's about unpeeling the onion um, to get to the root of problems. It's about understanding. What the what the correct intervention is, and then technology is a tool that can be used. It can be a really good, effective tool. It might be the tool you want to use. It might not be the tool you want to use. In our book, one of the stories, um, this is a little bit of a spoiler because I love the story, but um, and I know we, we both love it. But it's uh, one of the stories. This the intervention that was needed was a staple. Um, yeah, staple. So um, I think we really the 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 main point being um, it's it's not about the, the technology. It's not about the coolest technology. It's not about the latest technology. It doesn't matter how good your technology is. <laughs> um, you are still there. There are still humans at the center um, of the the problem solving uh, of the of the problem you are trying to solve. Tara, do you have? 
I mean, I think we can under, we think technology is important and our institutions, if they want to serve people, need to keep up with the digital age. But make no mistake, we really make kind of clear that an app did not end homelessness with Built for Zero. Um, and that if, and quite frankly, if you digitize a broken process, you have a digitized broken process. It might even move faster and work worse for people. Hannah details in the first chapter, a big multi-year digitization of a broken process. But, but actually sometimes what people write in the margins of a, of a process might be really important <laughs> and the digitization doesn't capture it. And especially, I think we, this, the staple story is about understanding root problems um, and what is causing friction. And so the, this practice and the definition we espouse, which in some ways is very broad, you know, data, the application of data, design, and delivery to advance the public good, but is also um, quite narrow. We felt really confident that if we had picked a technology today, that this book will be um, irrelevant shortly, that what technology is to us changes all the time, but that, that we can focus it on the public good is what we're really pressing people to do. Great. Right. Um, we have a, another question here. I think you may have touched on this a little bit, uh, but just, you know, maybe reiterating that, um, you know, your your book highlights several successful case studies. Um, you know, you also talk about, you know, some places where the thing was promising on the front end and then, you know, it, it may have not had the um, the champion to continue to carry it forward. And, and which speaks to, you know, how much of this work, and we talked a little bit about it on the storytelling side, how much of this work is dependent on, you know, convincing the right person or right persons um, as part of this. And so just the one question here is, is just around, um, I think that's still in some ways kind of the min minority of folks uh, that, that like really kind of get it on, 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 on first uh, hearing. Um, and so the question is just how do you continue to break through the cynicism, you know, especially for, for other folks who, who see maybe too much data as an issue, right? Or who, who think that like, hey, well, I was hired here because I know this issue. Um, we have some of the best minds in the world trying to tackle this issue in our department. Why, why do we need to spend time out in the field that is gonna slow us down, et cetera, et cetera. How do you break through some of that cynicism um, as part of this work? Bring them out into the field with you. <laughs> um, I think is the short, is the short answer. Um, uh, yes. People are of course, every, people have every right to be cynical. Um, there's been so much bad technology thrown into government, um, or and you know we're kind of bombarded every day with technology that hasn't really fully been thought through, um, or people trying to solve a problem with technology. Don't get me started on the Excelsior Pass, which is the vaccine passport that they just rolled out uh, in here in New York, um, for example. If anyone who's working on that is wants to give me a, a call, happy to talk about it. Um, I think that um, the you know the story that Tara told earlier about uh, the Sevilla team, the team in Michigan who brought the top people to who made them go through the process to experience what it's like to be a human on the other end. Um, we've also heard that um, some people have had a lot of, uh, one thing that's been really effective is bring people with you on your research, show them. And the research doesn't have to be, this is one thing that I learned actually um, in my work at the US uh, Digital Service, we did a lot of guerrilla research. Um, that still serves me well to this day. And I think um, it's an underutilized tool. So um, bringing people with you to like, look, here are the people you're trying to serve. Hear their, listen to their story, watch them try to fill out this form, see what this is really like. Um, I think that that is a great way to break through the cynicism is let's go talk to some people. I think we're both super hopeful about this, that it has been done, proves that it can be done. <laughs> Um, I don't want to underestimate that change doing big things is hard. Some, some of these efforts happened really quickly. We are, our team at the new practice lab um, worked with the incredible Department of Labor in the state of New Jersey on a paid leave project. Um, New Jersey is one of the handful of states that provides families um, paid family and medical leave. And it turned out, you know, uh, it was taking a long time to cut the checks. And 
upon closer inspection, it wasn't that they needed more check cutters or adjudicators. A lot of people got hung up on a couple of questions. And when you when you have 100,000 people or a million people um, filling out a form or, or um, applying for a service, when 20 or 40% of people get hung up on question two, that really slows down the train. <laughs> and so really just sitting, this isn't complicated, the amazing civil servants in New Jersey sat with a few tired moms and dads who were trying to apply or caregivers who were trying to apply for this and saw how frequently, it's not, it's not like this is a week or two of research, how frequently people get stuck on question X. And could we just, let's try this version. Is that less confusing? No, let's try this conversion. Let's try this picture with a chart about the number of months. And um, they've changed their forms. They've changed their uh, materials. The, the team leaders in the Department of Labor are leading that work, not our team. And so that wasn't years. That didn't require a new agency head. Did it take leadership from the top and the bottom and some willingness? Yes. But, it, but again, like really making things work for people um, is this art of listening, testing, and trying. And I think it can be, we feel optimistic that it can be done. That's great. Um, I want to sneak in a few more questions if we can, um, and I'm going to mash up kind of two of them. Uh, there's basically one question on what role can public libraries play uh, in this work um, as part of um, continuing to, to, to um, build public interest tech and, and, and this notion of public problem solving. Um, and then, you know, maybe the opposite side of this is uh, what role should the private sector be playing here um, uh, as part of this as well? <laughs> Do you want to roll for this one? <laughs> Go for it. Um, so, how the what role could the private sector be playing? This is there's not enough time <laughs> to go into all of the different pieces of this. Um, I think there is a role for the private sector. Um, I think that role is not, why can't we just have Amazon do this? Um, which is something that we've seen a lot, um, especially with the, with the vaccine uh, rollout. Um, there were, there was a, a lot of, and you know, I think that this, we see this in the field, it comes around again, why can't Zappos just do it? Why can't Apple just do it? Um, there's usually a reason. There's usually, um, there are usually many reasons, uh, but that's not to say that um, there, there isn't a role. I mean, right where we are right now, um, a lot of, look, the private sector is developing technology and has a methodology for implementing it that works. Um, government could certainly stand to benefit from that. Are there shortcuts to loop in the, tech, the private sector and make that happen? Uh, sure, could be, could be. It's it's not trivial, and as anyone, I think we have a lot of people in the um, audience who have worked with government or are currently in government. Um, it's you know once you start getting into data privacy and privacy issues, um, it becomes a lot more complex than let's just get Amazon to do it. Um, but is there is there is that a good thing to keep in mind and think about as we go forward? Sure. I'm happy to jump in on the libraries. Um, you know, I think, and I think libraries are especially important. It's one of the forms of infrastructure that we really do have everywhere, small communities, big communities. Um, and I think when we contemplate the challenges of the digital divide and access that the role of bricks and mortar libraries in helping us contemplate the, the equity um, is really important. And there's very few, um, very, very few things that we have like libraries that are just kind of here and there and everywhere and that could be anchors and open to all. Obviously, the pandemic has complicated the, um, the bricks and mortar everything and including for libraries, but um, thinking about what we have that is our public infrastructure we're broadening as a country the way we have this conversation to, to start to think about care infrastructure out there along with roads and libraries, but that um, Libraries, at least for me, are quite personal. The, the bricks and mortar Dobbs Ferry Library um, was a place where all kids could go and get stickers for summer reading. <laughs> and I think libraries as a place um, that uh, of equity to bring libraries into the digital age, some amazing efforts in New York and DC and others to really reconceptualize the library as a community home. Um, 
have, you know, have real possibility. Great. Um, so I'll just, I'll wrap up on, on this last question. I know we're about at time. Um, and just, you know, kind of reflecting on, and, and you both start the book with, you know, you've come at this from kind of different perspectives, Hannah as a technologist, you know, and found your, you know, private sector and then found your way to government service. Tara died in the wool, public policy, uh, you know, hands on, on everything. Um, but you, 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 you found each other and, and you're kind of here now. Right. And, um, you know, I think you make the argument that it's not that like that kind of how we solve, you know, these big public problems in the future will, will be a blend of both and, and that we need to, to be training the future, um, public policy, not just public policy student, but, you know, um, tra training the future of public servant um, in many ways, you know, to, to be able to think about both of these uh, ends of the spectrum and really to kind of define the solutions that, that exist in the middle. Um, just for both of you, just any parting words, call, call to action uh, that you would have for, um, you know, the future public policy students, um, engineer, professionals who are moving into this space uh, that you'd want to just kind of leave folks with. I'm happy to jump in. Um, you know, I, I think the the differences in our backgrounds, Hannah and I, you know, helped in the building of this book. But we pushed each other from our respective perspectives. But we think um, we think we need profoundly more voices in the mix on making on solving public problems. It's at the essence of why we wrote it, and that doesn't mean that data scientists and engineers are going to replace lawyers and economists, it does mean we're going to need economists who understand what big data does and doesn't do. Um, we're going to need engineers who are trained in the ethics of some of the complex questions we've talked about. And both of these groups of people need to profoundly represent who we are in a way that they don't today. Because as you heard from Amon Ra, you know, who sits in these seats, who looks at the data, and who comes with the questions really changes this. So we hope people will see that it doesn't matter if you are in one of these tech roles, that there is a place for you in this work. Um, and if you can't see it now, um, we're hoping that, that a broader set of voices and folks from different communities, um, you can grow up as, an, as Clarence Fordell in you know, 2021 would see a place to, do, to tackle uh, police inequity um, straight out of engineering school, but also that you cannot graduate from public policy school not having thought about how your policy reaches end users. And so I think we see a place for people with both of the types of skills and, and additional ones in this work. That was beautiful. Just let us end there. <laughs> All right, well, thank you both. Um, congratulations. Uh, on the, the, the launch of the book um, and excited that it's out there in the world. Um, so thank you.